Ben Walgate from the 401 Files. Ben is an investigator and researcher of thought-provoking subjects such as the UFO phenomena, Bigfoot and even the paranormal. He loves being out in nature where he spends a lot of his time exploring and investigating known hotspots for evidence of strange phenomena. Based in North Yorkshire where he spends most of his time boots on the ground investigating. Ben recently took time out to join me in the vault in the very first session. We delve into the history of the 401 files, where and why it all began. We discuss some of Ben's most significant investigations and we discuss the future ahead for Ben and the 401 files. Grab a drink, settle in and let's begin. So, Ben, thank you for coming along and um, joining me in the vault for the very, very first session um, of uh, interviews, either pre-recorded or live. And um, it can be more poetic that you're the first guest on the session um, because, you know, for me personally, um, outside of the team that I, of guys that I work with on the vault, you've been super supportive and a big inspiration to me and, and, and just a big help, both with everything YouTube and with life as well. So um, I really appreciate you coming along and it's awesome to catch up with you. No, thank you, G. That was um, a great introduction. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so, first and foremost, I wanted to congratulate you um, on your 12,000 subscribers and growing with the 401 files. Uh, how does that feel? It's crazy. Like, um, it's, it's been a lot of hard work getting out there, filming, doing editing, learning things on the ground as well, like picking this up. Because I've never I've got no background in videography or anything like that. So, when I first started off, I just fumbled my way through it and never really expected to get any subscribers really or anyone watching me. So to have 12,000 now people um, continually coming back and watching me, it just it blows my mind. Yeah, I can remember when we were watching for that big uh, crossover to the 10K and yeah. that seems that that was really recent and then it's jumped another 2K, you know, in quite a short amount of time. So it's sort of multiplying quickly and you've, uh, and I was, um, I was looking at the coverage that you had from the Gazette up there in Yorkshire as well, um, yeah. where they were talking about it. So some really good press coverage. So congratulations. I mean, it's just a, it's just amazing, and I think it really well deserved. Um, so I just wanted to start off by seeing how you were feeling about that because I bet it feels good. Yeah, right? yeah, it does. I try not to pay attention to the numbers. To be honest, you can get lost in it all, and youtube then becomes numbers rather than the content and the message that you're trying to get across so i do look at it and i do get excited when it's, it's coming to a landmark but um yeah i try and concentrate on what you guys are asking for and, and the message really yeah definitely um well so that leads me nicely into sort of my first question so you know if you go back to the beginning, you know, what brought you to pa the paranormal and the thought provoking subject? Was it one experience or was it several that gave you that interest in the subject matter that you cover on the 401 files? It was, it was growing up in a haunted house um, that was just really active with poltergeist activity. And at the time of the young child, seeing the buzz in the house, um, with all the adults, you know, hearing a conversation taking place over here and someone stops talking when you walk in the room over here. And I was really intrigued by all that because they knew something that I didn't. And it was like, I need to know what's going on. And when I realized that even they didn't know what was going on, then that led me to, to try and seek answers for myself. And I guess just throughout life, growing up, adulthood, um, I've been obsessed. I've been obsessed still, even to this day, trying to find those answers. So, you know, I, I kind of knew that about you, but I wanted everybody who's watching um, this interview to kind of know that because I know you had a couple of experiences growing up that were really significant that, that brought you. But I guess I know that about you, but I don't know then what made you decide to bring it to, you know, broadcasting and, and YouTube. You know, where, where did that decision come into play? 
So like me and brother, we was talking one night around at his house, like we usually do, about some of the events that happened to us in the house growing up. And we used to go back and forth, say, like picking each other's brains about what it could be. And you know how it is when you get together, when you're sharing an experience with someone. We was both like, oh, do you remember when this happened? And, oh my God, do you remember when it happened to you? And my brother said, oh, you should do one of these YouTube videos that people are doing because like, there's people out there that go ghosting in. And at this time, YouTube wasn't massive. I mean, it was definitely big. YouTube was big. It was taking off, but there was still room to jump in the mix and and try and and try and be somebody. That makes sense. Mm. So we started we started throwing a few ideas around about how we could do this, what topic would we talk about, and what would we call the name of the channel. And so, just for a joke, my brother started googling a few things, and one of the sites that he tried to access brought up the four row one error message on the PC. Um. And so he thought, what the hell? So he Googled what 401 meant, and it means something like unauthorized access. So he was like, that's it. It's 401 files, like the files that you're going to be talking about, UFOs, paranormal, plus the unauthorized access. Makes sense. So just for a joke, we kind of called it the 401 files. Um, and then my brother didn't stick didn't stick with it. He had work commitments and other things going on. So he kind of dropped out. But for me, it was always, a real big buzz just to get out with the camera and, and, and try and talk about these things. I love that. I didn't know that that's where the name came from and it's so yeah. it's so poignant. That's absolutely cool. 401 means unauthorised access. Yeah. I love it. What year was it that you um, actually started the channel? We started about four or five years, about five years ago now, but we'd been filming a long, lot before that on other channels. so. In the start, we used to get out and do kind of like, um, there was no talking or anything. It was just going through creepy buildings and doing a bit of B-roll with music over the top. And then maybe we'd put a bit of writing up on the screen to explain what this place was about, the history of it. And so at this point, I've never had, I never had the confidence to talk on camera. I didn't really know how I wanted to come across. That happened about five years ago um, when I decided that I want to be a part of this. I want to start sharing some of these ideas that I'm having and hopefully get some feedback from, from the people in the community. So five years ago, I'd say, is when I roughly started the 401 files um, properly. Well, that is good because, you know, 12,000 subscribers in five years, that's pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good going because we're yeah. we're getting on to two and we've got the 350, <laughs> you know, or, or there yeah. around about. But, you know, it, it's like you said, it's not really about numbers. It's about the audience and, um, you know, one of the things that we find in them and i see it with the the guys that support you on your channel as well it's that loyalty it's that um you know the guys that are with us here on the vault are extremely like loyal and, and we get the same people engaging all the time and and i yeah. guess you experience that with the 401 files as well yeah the beautiful yeah. thing about youtube for me why it's better than things like uh, netflix and you know these other tv um, streaming platforms is because people might say, oh, well, why do people want to come and watch you on 401 files when they can just watch a TV series on, on Netflix? But there's that personal element to it, right? Over, over time, people get to know you as a person, they get to know your personality, your quirks, and that's what brings people back. You see, you don't get that with a TV series. You might do for a period of time, but then it stops and that's it. With my channel, your channel, we're constantly every week, every fortnight, you know, bringing people into our, into our worlds. And it's that connectivity, that, that level of, um, of that personal touch, I think that really makes people be, like you said, become loyal and stick around. Yeah. I'm definitely going to ask you some questions about that personal touch later as well. Cause I think that is one of the magical things about what you do and how you do it. And, um, but you obviously get out and about quite a lot. That's one thing that you keep encouraging me to, um, to do a, a little bit more. And it is something that I'm definitely looking um, to introduce to the channel a lot more. Um, but I don't really, you know, because again, you know, we've had many, many chats offline and uh, not just about YouTube. And I know that you've had quite a textured life and you've served in the military. Um, yeah. So I guess those skills have given you an advantage in doing a lot of your location, um, exploring and, and filming in the wild, right? Yeah. 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 Just yeah. confidence in general to be able to, you know, like when you're walking down the side of the road, you might see some overgrown meditation there and you might 
a normal person might think oh, I'm not going through there but for me that's that's big arrow saying I've ventured this way so I just kind of push through and, and that's how I do it yeah definitely and, and I think people underestimate you know I've said to you plenty of times that watching some of your videos give me give me anxiety uh, because yeah. I, I always put myself in your shoes being out there in 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 uh, Yorkshire in the deep uh, woods and forests in the middle of the night by yourself and it's not like a bear grill situation where there's a, a crew around you i know that you've no. gone out in the past and collaborated with people and and definitely gone out and about but most of the time you go out by yourself and, and you're out there overnight in these really remote locations and i guess you know if i was to do that i'm not very well trained i don't have your military background and, and i i would just be fearful so i'm, I'm looking forward we, we've discussed us going out together and I'm looking forward to um, going out with you in the future but I, I don't I guess at this stage I don't think I have your um, courage uh, that you have and uh, I've got the most biggest amount of admiration for that yeah it never gets easier as well like a lot of people yeah, think because of the military easier. background that I should be brave and I should be doing it. the difference with that is you've got a platoon of maybe 20 other guys around you all carrying rifles you're all camouflaged up so the chances of anything seen out there you know you're on even playing fields um when you're on your own doing a YouTube video in a hot spot that's notorious for UFO sightings the paranormal and strange cryptids and there's no rifle and there's not 20 other guys behind you it's a different ball game altogether and I never get used to it sometimes I've found ways to adapt I've found ways and things to say to myself to make life easier but they can easily wear off and before you know it you're back there on the forest floor in the dark middle of nowhere and um, yeah that's, that's normally when reality kicks in yeah and it's it's because you see some scary stuff out there and hear some scary stuff right and uh... Oh God, I just don't know how sometimes I'd cope about it, cope with it knowing that I was by myself and, and there was nobody yeah. around me. And um, So you are a very brave man. And, and it's worth me mentioning at this point um, for those that are watching that don't know that you also have another channel called UK Wild Camping. And yeah. uh, I'll definitely put a link in the description and suggest that everybody check that out as well because it's really great to see you doing your, um, your uh, b bushcraft stuff. You know, that's also awesome. And again, I, I suppose that comes from your, your um, some of that comes from your military background and just the experience yeah. of going out and about. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, like, you know, you know me, G, through the conversations we've had and stuff. Growing up, I was always into the Cub Scouts, I was always in the forests, in the woods. Um, you know, playing around with sticks, lighting fires, um, and then from there it progressed to the army. Um, and I did really well in the army, got out, and then started the wild camping scene. So I've always been an outdoorsy type of person. Yeah, we had a similar background in terms of our childhood because I um, I lived in Cumbria uh, in a very sort of small town in Cumbria called Dalton in Furness. Uh, that's where I grew up till the, about the age of 12 and like yourself I was part of the Cubs and part of the Scouts and uh, you were just surrounded by countryside there it was a very small town that I lived in and um, you know and, and up there in the north end of the UK um, as you are um, so I think that is a, a, you know something that we've got in common I guess so but yeah. going back going back to what you were saying about that personal touch because um, actually I had this question that I wanted to ask because you've got this great ability to just share and conceptualize your thoughts and theories on camera uh, where does that skill come from or is it just something that you've polished along the way yeah that's that's just been a hell of a lot of trial and error like I mean you guys you gotta remember when you see that um, that might be like the 20th time I've actually tried to say what, what it is that I've said. A lot of the times, I mean, people don't know this, but sometimes I go out to film, I get there, I sit in the car, I look down the road and I think, I'm not feeling this. I am not feeling this one bit. And I get back in the car, I drive home, it's a waste of fuel, a waste of my time. But you have days like that. And then there's other days where I just can't get my words out. I know what I want to say, but I can't, I can't, I can't say it. Or I can't say it the way that I want to say it. And then sometimes you, you, you get the whole spiel out and then you say something really stupid at the end by accident and it's like, oh my God. And it's just, yeah, it's a lot of patience and, um, and just knowing that when you're at home and you're looking back on that footage, that's what matters. So although you're getting stressed now here in the moment because you can't get your words out, it's not going the way you planned, just think about when you're at home laid on the bed and you've got the bit that you wanted because that's permanent. That's what people are going to see forever. 
So all these other little mistakes that you're making and you're getting stressed about now, just keep going with it. Because the minute you get it, it's forever. And that kind of what I hate myself all the time because there is, there is time where I think, no, nah, screw this, I'm going on. It's not working. I can't say it properly. It's not coming out the way I want it to. But yeah, I just keep reminding myself that once you have said it properly, that's it. You're going to be happy with it. People are going to probably enjoy what you said and be able to interact with you know what I'm saying does it make sense yeah yeah no definitely because um you know where you've been encouraging me to get out a little bit more I've been going out and doing um random bits of filming uh sort of in deep areas of Dartmoor and um you know, there's one day that I was out and my microphone just wasn't working. It was really windy up there because I was right in yeah. the middle of this really open space on the moors. And um, and so I was trying to use my phone microphone and then you could see on the playback that it was just all the wind was coming through. I was also trying to film and I'm going to be working on a documentary soon and I was trying to film the intro to that. And funny enough, I kept getting disturbed by these wild ponies that they were gathering around me. And, and you know what? I've just decided that I'm going to leave it in there. I'm going to edit it, and uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to leave it in there um, with yeah. <laughs> sort of the, this, these ponies all around me. Because uh, I think sometimes it's good to see it as as it happens and as yeah. it is natural. I, I think so. I, I mean, that's that's one thing I was worried about as well. Is that you know people when they meet me because I can, if I go to Benson Cliffs now, if I go to Flamborough Head, or you know people on the North Yorkshire Moor see me. A lot of people, a lot of people. There's been times when people have recognised me and they've come wow. over and started to speak they started to speak to me and um I always get this really awkward feeling of being self-aware because I think when I'm talking to these people, you've seen me on YouTube saying everything really polished and like sounding really like um you know, like I'm some kind of what's the word? Expert okay. or like a, like a scholar or something like that, some, some yeah. real clever guy that just is meticulous with his words. That's what you've seen. And now here I am in real life and I don't have 20 takes to speak to you. I've only got this. So, I, yeah, I always, I always find that that's awkward. Well, um, that's actually, I'm glad you've mentioned a, a couple of locations there because my next question was going to be, um, you know, throughout all your, let's not just say you're filming, but anywhere that you might have been just, um, even before your YouTube days, but do you have a favourite location or an experience where you've you've filmed or been? Uh, I don't have a favourite location, but there's definitely a place that is is up there on the scariest places that I've been, and it's um it's it's only ever appeared it's only ever appeared once on my channel. Um, tried to go back and film there again. But um, I got basically moved on by the guy that owns the place. And it was a church that's not far from where I live. I took my brother there actually not so long ago. And if you go back on my channel, Jim, I'm not sure if you've seen this one, but it's the one where I found the teeth inside the forest. Have you seen that? Uh, no, I haven't. But what I will do is um, I'll make sure to add it to the link um, for this evening so that anybody watching can also go and check it out. Um, so yeah. after the show, if you if you let me know the title of that, I'll definitely dig that up. But carry on, sorry. Yeah, so it's a very weird yeah, place. So. Um, it's a church. It's a really old church. And I went in there one day. There's nobody in there, which is usually the case with these old churches. And I was looking for um, a bolt hole, which is basically a hole in the ground, which takes you down a tunnel. And, and in the day, back in the day, what would happen is when monks and priests were being persecuted, they'd jump down into these holes run through the tunnels and it would bring them up somewhere else in the grave, in the, in the gardens of the graveyard or something. And that's how they would escape capture. So I was looking for one of these bolt holes and I found one. I found one of these holes that led down into a tunnel underneath the church floor. And I didn't go down it because I thought if I start making my way down that, someone walks into the church door, I'm, I'm in big trouble. So I decided to go out into, the, into the, the grounds and start looking around there, do a bit of filming outside. And there was like a little wooded area, like a plantation with these trees. And I went in into there, did a bit of filming. And the wind just picked up. And the horse in the nearby field went crazy. And as I looked down on the floor, there was two pigeons with no heads that had been beheaded. And I thought, what the hell is going on here? And then I saw a smashed urn. So somebody had been stealing from the graveyard and bringing them in bringing the urns into this wood, practicing some kind of practicing some kind of witchcraft 
with the or sac sacrifices with these engines. So I'm filming this and I'm talking and then I saw a necklace on the floor and this necklace has teeth just surrounded it's a, it's a necklace of teeth. It was the most you know, you often hear, especially in this field, like talking about the unexplained and weird things. You hear about witchcraft, you hear about black magic and all the different kind of um, ritualistic practices. But to see it firsthand and realize there's something this life. Like somebody comes here on their own, sits in these woods, and does this stuff. That's real stuff going. Like, and the whole way home in the car, I just couldn't stop thinking about that. Like, who did this? Was it a man? Was it a woman? What has gone wrong in their life? Like, why did they take time out of their day or their night to come sit here on their own? They had two pigeons. And like, and then I started thinking, why was the necklace left behind? Because someone's obviously put a lot of time and effort into that necklace. And then I started thinking, well, maybe they did this, rit this ritual. Something did materialize. They absolutely crapped themselves, dropped the, the necklace and ran out. I had all these different things going through my head and it was just a, from start to finish, a really, really creepy place. That does sound very creepy. I'm definitely going to check out that episode. Um, yeah, I mean, it could have been a group of people, you know, right? also, yes. you know, can't, can't presume it's an individual. And where you said about the necklace being left, um, you know, yeah, that's a, a very possible um, a conclusion or it could be that they got disturbed by, by someone. Uh, yeah. and again also had to run off because they got you know a cemetery caretaker or something well, that's like that. what happened to me yeah, yeah the second time that i went there um, i said to my brother look i found this place it's absolutely amazing like and there's some really weird um satanic stuff going on there that we need to go check out so we jumped in the car and, and the first thing that my brother said was where is this church where are you taking me because it's in the middle of nowhere and i'm in the middle of nowhere you're driving down this road there's no other houses it's just the weirdest place to have a church to begin with because i don't know how anyone's getting there without driving um so yeah we walked down down the path to the church and we had a quick scout about and then literally about 15 20 minutes later the caretaker which was an old guy turned up and um, asked us what we was doing so um yeah we just we kind of got out of there and didn't really do any more filming but even my brother said in that short period of time, there's a really off feeling about this place. It just does not feel good at all. Mm. Yeah, very, very weird. But um, as I say, I'll put a link in the description and I'm going to check out that episode because that sounds particularly uh, freaky and interesting all at the same time. I also really wanted to ask you, um, is there any person or persons or channels um, on YouTube that have heavily influenced or inspired you throughout your journey? Yeah, there's a few inspirations um, that come to mind. So in terms of the podcast and, and a lot of things I used to listen to in the early days, it was The Unexplained with Howard Hughes. That really got me, um, that really got me inspired. Um, Paul Sinclair, obviously, is another researcher here on the, on the East Coast of the UK, always appearing on different podcasts. Um, and he's, he's a guy in the know, like he's had a lot of experiences himself, but he speaks to a lot of people that have also had their own experiences. So listening to Paul speak really got me inspired. And Justin, obviously on YouTube at Mountain Peace Mysteries, um, another great guy that, that inspired me as well. Yeah, I can understand. Um, you know, I'm not so familiar with the, uh, the um, do you say it was called The Unexplained? Yeah. Yeah, I'm Big not podcast, as familiar. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with that as I am, obviously, with uh, Justin and, and Mountain Beast Mysteries. So, but I can definitely understand the inspiration come from Justin. And there's a lot of, um, you know, we've talked about this on many occasions. There's a lot of similarities between the way that yourself approaches this kind of thought-provoking content and the way that Justin approaches it as well. And yeah. um, you know, it's certainly inspired me as well to come at it at a very credible way i mean one of the things that i love about justin's channel is that and maybe it's because he's canadian and uh he's not american and, and uh yes. he's more yes. he's more aligned with how we canadians are more aligned with how we kind of do things in the uk but it's the way he doesn't come at it from a, a kind of overly dramatic way um it's just you know very factual yeah. very very um controlled and 
yeah so i can understand that inspiration but thank you for thank you for sharing so I'm, i want to kind of you know because your channel covers so much areas of content you do uh, the paranormal you do ufology you do cryptids but i just want to talk a minute about if you don't mind more about moving into the ufology subject um and what's what your belief is do you think that there are other species out there but we they've not reached earth yet or do you believe they're already here and there are more than maybe one species what's you know through all your research that you've done what's your yeah. kind of theory yeah. on the whole um ufo subject yeah i think yeah. without a shadow of a doubt the earth is being visited by multiple species um many many species um they all look different they all have different agendas but i just think if we look at some some of the cases throughout history like the flatwoods monster that looks very different to say the betty and barney hill extraterrestrials and they look different to the pascagoula extraterrestrials and so that that alone if you were to believe these cases which i do they're all very credible people with lots of factual stuff to back it then if you believe those cases you've got to believe that more than just one species is stepping foot here on earth and, and exploring and um yeah i, I do for, for whatever reason they're here i don't i don't know i wouldn't like to dive into that but they are here i was gonna say that there's a lot of people that might be watching that would think you know christ that's quite a thrin a fringe kind of opinion to have um but actually there's you know we've covered it a lot on the vault there's actually a lot of senior officials that have come forward in the last few years and when they're coming forward and being a lot more um, transparent, they're actually saying that, hey, it's not just one species, it's multiple. And actually, mm -hmm. I've heard comment that some are nice and some are not so nice, are diff more difficult for them to get on with. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, I, it's not as fringe as some might feel to actually have that belief or that theory, because a lot of official people are now coming forward and that's exactly what they're saying. A lot of these extraterrestrials I've just mentioned, like the Pascagoula case, the Flatwoods Monster case, and you know, um, even Travis Bolland, he experienced a different species again. Yeah, yeah, his his experience was more human-like. And even with the Betty and Barney Hill case, and I, I know that they saw the the uh, stereotypical grey aliens, but they saw someone on board the craft that was more human-like as well. And so I think there's hybrids. I think there's people up there um, that are traveling to Earth. And they look human, but not quite human. So they might have larger ears or green eyes, right? Like reptilian green eyes, but everything else about them looks human. And then people always say to me, but that is so far-fetched, Ben. Like, what is the chances of an, an extraterrestrial out there in space looking just like we humans do? That's basically you portraying um, the human image onto extraterrestrials. It's just not realistic. But I think it is realistic. I think it's realistic because it works. There's a reason that fish have fins and a tail because they're in water. It works. They haven't grown legs because they don't need them. And I think that's the same with the, the human hybrids. They mm. look human because the, the human form of two arms, two legs, upright, walking bipedal works. And with evolution, we've seen time and time again that what works, what is the dominant gene sticks around and carries on throughout. throughout. And so I don't think it is too far-fetched to imagine that there are other species of aliens that look like humans. Yeah, and it, it's quite heavily backed up by quite a few famous, uh, phys you know, um, professors of physics like uh, uh, Stanton, uh, Friedman, you know, uh, and yeah. people like him that are talking about it a lot lately. When you when you you have to sort of equate things like logic, mathematics using our own uh, evolution as example because again there's certain ingredients that life as we know it needs uh, and one of them is uh, you know certain elements of of gravity and yeah. you know that would then mean that most species that would be successful in that kind of environment would develop bipedal and yeah. you know so yeah there's a there's a lot of um science that can actually back up some of these theories and again there's a lot of people out there that are scientists that talk about it so so for you in the history of ufology is there you know if you were sat down with a 
hardened skeptic say for example for the, let's create a scenario i'm a hardened skeptic um what piece of evidence in the whole history of ufology would you would you use to challenge that hardened skeptic's view or opinion is there something in the history of ufology that you think is the best example of evidence uh just one specific uh, one specific case i don't want to combine my reasons if you've got if you've got a number of of uh examples or like you say you want to combine um your thought process by all means yeah i would say there's a few then um the first one would be the betty and Barney hill case um you've got to remember that Betty and Barney Hill were an interracial couple. They were dating in a time when this was frowned upon. So the last thing that they would have been thinking about would be to draw attention to themselves during this hostile time where blacks really shouldn't have been with whites and whites shouldn't have been with blacks. But they did. They had this experience and they came out and they spoke openly about it, knowing that it would bring on all this ridicule. But more than that, Betty came back with a star map when she was taken by these beings. She, she, she asked them, like, where, where do you come from? And this being drew out a star map for Betty. And this star map, um, what is it? Retic reticular, 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 like yeah, yeah, yeah. Reticular. This, this star map wasn't even discovered until many years after Betty had drawn it. So how is she privy to this information if there's no truth behind that? I mean, she's not an astronomer. She's not some kind of top secret government official. She shouldn't have any, you know, knowledge of this constellation that even world renowned, renowned astronomers do, but she did. And it's the same with the Travis Wallen case. When you look at these seven guys, I believe it was, all took lie detector tests, all passed except one, which was, I think, the youngest of the group. And even his test never said failed. I think it said something like, um, it was inconclusive. It was inconclusive, exactly. Um, you know, and, and even when they were they were pressured and told that they would be up on murder charges, none of them changed their story. None of them backed down. And the years following, they were all offered large large sums of money, which they refused. Um, large sums of money to come against Travis Walton and say that he was a hoaxer. This was all a lie, and they never took the money. I just think that little little things like that really made the ufo case believable and then if we we pile on top of that the fact that it's not just your everyday tin foil hat wearing lunatic now we've got government officials saying it we've got military personnel saying it police officers teachers doctors scientists all these people now are having are, are having experiences and because we live in a time where it's becoming okay to speak about these things more and more people are and yeah. I just think all, all that combined really is a strong case to say that there is more going on here than, than we realise. It's really interesting that you've used those two examples because um, certainly the Travis Walton uh, story I'm very, very familiar with. And obviously I'm familiar with uh, Betty and Barney Hill. Um, but the thing that I do know about the two cases, which is something that really frustrates me, because if you were talking to somebody who's not very educated in in the realm of ufology or or somebody who's quite just naturally skeptical everybody seems to think that these people have made some sort of fame or or riches out of coming forward yeah. and saying what they've done but that's not the truth these guys um in fact you know if you take somebody like travis walton it's only made his life a bit of a nightmare um yeah. Uh, and brought a lot of ridicule and, and negative attention to him and certainly not at, you know people have seen that they've made a film about it um fire in the sky so oh he's obviously made a lot of money from that film no he hasn't made a lot of money from that film that's not why the way holiday hollywood works anyway um and he certainly didn't write the book of his own story i don't believe or he was collaborated with it but yeah it just frustrates me that people think that these people you know this was before the days of social media. So they weren't doing it for clickbait. They weren't doing it uh, for, you know, making the, the newspaper headline. They were just basically being honest. And uh, Betty and Barney Hill have uh, repeatedly been, um, been labeled by lots of official people as very, very credible witnesses. Like, you know, everything they said 
uh, the, the two stories separate and together or combined and the, there was no change in the story and yeah so it's, it's interesting that you've chosen those two cases now that leads me nicely on to something that I was I'm dying to talk to you about actually because I don't know you know I'm sure you have heard about um, there's a lot of noise at the moment from people like Elizondo and George Knapp and um, Nick Pope that there's going to be some sort of revelation, big revelation, or um, a lot of information being disclassified in 2023. And I'm sure you're aware of all of this. What, what What's your take on it? I absolutely is. I always have done. Whenever, whenever I hear somebody say, oh, new files are going to be released and they're going to disclose all that, I never believe it because think about what we're actually saying. So the people have hid this from us and now we're going to release it to us. That's never going to happen like that. The people who are in control of releasing this information are never going to give you the juicy stuff. And I mean, if, if you look at all the files that have been released over all the years, and there is a large, large number there to look through, there's no juicy stuff. There's, there's no juicy... And you look at the Alan Godfrey case. Alan Godfrey reported his case. He was an, uh, an off-duty police officer that was abducted, um, was taken aboard a craft, met the extraterrestrials, they did experiments on him. Um, he came back, reported it to the Ministry of Defence, and then under the Disclosure Act, tried to pull up his own file on the case. There was nothing there. And this was the, the guy who experienced this. This was the guy that lived through it, reported it. And you know, it's just, I don't believe that they're ever going to give you the juicy stuff, ever. So I'm never really excited. So, so you're staying very reserved at the moment? Why, yeah, why would they? Why would they, you know, come out and say, well, we've known about this for over 70 years, uh, we've been sat on it, and we've drip fed you all the really not important stuff, but this time, we've, we've all decided that we're going to be really honest with you this time. There you go. They're never going to do this. It just yeah. doesn't make sense. I, I don't think know if you... I think, sorry, I think they've got, like, they've got to show that they're, you know, like, it's a public... Uh, Put their hand in the air and the screen of these files to be released. The law that says you have a right after a certain amount of years to see these files. So, you know, they're just kind of doing their thing. They're honoring this right, but they're in control of how much they can release. So, there you go. Have a little bit, have a look through it, fill your boots, but you're not getting the juicy stuff. We've, we've lived to our, our end of the bargain by saying that we'll release the files, but what we will do is decide which files we release. There you go. And I think that's, that's how they do it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you managed to catch our live Monty Zone, which was called um, UFO Disclosure, and um, almost pretty much carbon copy of what you've just said there is kind of what I was saying on that show, is that you would think somebody that's interested and has had a, you know, since my teen years, uh, a, a big interest in, in ufology, you would think I would be excited about all these kind of revelations and stuff coming, but realistically i can't see it happening because it means that governments organizations militaries of the world are going to have to step forward and say hey guys we've been lying to you for years we've been covering up stuff for years um, yeah. and no matter how much yeah. they say well that was back then and it's not now well actually in the last decade alone there's been a lot of stuff which has been covered up by people that are now in those positions in those offices and so they won't be able to sort of stand there or saintly going oh yeah but that's not us we're being completely honest with you now um it's it, logically it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense <laughs> Think yeah. about where these files are kept. So they keep the files in a huge storage um, cabinet somewhere, let's just say. How, how, who's going to this, this cabinet and who's getting these files out? Do you know what I mean? It's the same people that kept the problems. So what do you think they're going to do? Give us, you know, without checking through them, just give us everything? It's not going to happen. It's not realistic. No. If, there was a, so if there was a mutual figure involved in this, someone that could say, right, Everybody out, I want to go in there without anyone going in first, without tampering with the files. I want to go in and I want to do this myself. Then, then we'd stand a better chance. But the people that get the files out of the cabinet and releasing them are the same people who have, have kept their secret. It just, it's really bizarre that people think now they would be honest. 
Yeah, I mean... Sorry about, it's, sorry about Lily, she, she just come back. I've locked her out all night. Oh, no, it's, it's awesome to see Lily. I, I yeah. feel like I just want to put my hand through the screen and just give her a stroke. Yeah, she's gorgeous. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we've talked a lot about ufology. Just sort of touching on the Bigfoot Wildman subject, because that is something that you um, are also very interested in. And, and you have played a, a significant part in... Because I kind of had a looser interest in it. And then I think it was you, um, I think it was even before we did the live, where we did the Bigfoot live together, uh, you were suggesting to me that I go back and look at some of the people that have been reviewing the Patterson Gimlin footage. And mm -hmm. it was then that I started seeing some better scientific analysis of that footage. And it, it kind of really, you know, inspired me. Um, but getting to my question, have you heard, because it's sort of very uh, related to what we were just talking about, have you heard the George Knapp interview uh, that was just released this week with uh, David Pilaudis, who does the Missing 411? No, I haven't just seen it. Right, well, after we come off air, I will send you a link. You've got to check it out. It's quite exciting. Um, yeah. Basically, yeah. for those of you guys that are watching that are not that familiar with David Pilates, he is, uh, you know, the person behind the Missing 411, the books, the documentaries. Uh, there's a documentary that's about to come out in November 15th, I believe, that is Missing 411, the UFO connection, which I'm very excited about as well. And that's from David Pilates. But George McNapp recently interviewed David Pilates, and it's only an audio interview. Um, and David Blaudis revealed, he, he said he could only reveal certain bits of information, but he revealed that there's a group of scientists that have been working on the study and the research of the existence of Bigfoot Sasquatch in uh, North America in the last five years. And they're about, and they've actually got some results and they're about to share them once they get to the end of their project and they can 100% validate these results um, and he's talking about it in this interview and it sounds extremely exciting. You sound amazing. I'd need to send you the link actually so I can listen. Yeah, I definitely will. We're going to be talking about it. Well, at least I'm going to try and feature it on the next Monty Zone um, that's coming up at the end of this month. Uh, but yeah, I'll definitely show you the link for that. It's really yeah. interesting. And David Plowdy's for me is a very credible source. You know, again, a, a previous um, or a former police officer. So very credible in terms of his ability to kind of witness stuff and analyze stuff. So yeah, but so just touching on the Bigfoot Wildman subject then, what for you got you really, you know, because the UK is not known. Uh, I think in the history of the UK, there's, there's been two official, uh, and when I say very, I mean official, um, uh, through the Bigfoot Field Research Organization, two reports here in the UK. So we're not a country that's very well known for reports and sightings of Bigfoot. So what got you interested in that subject? Yeah, you started looking at um, yeah. the UFO phenomenon yeah. and paranormal. You you obviously read that long news of YouTube and you know googling things. And a few a few times, the UK Bigfoot or the UK Wildman would pop up, and I thought well, that's interesting. Never never heard of that before. And like everybody else, I started off trying to investigate these locations where people have reported seeing things, and you know there was hearsay about this guy saw this big floor of that wild man. So I'd go to these areas. And like most people, they started out thinking it was flesh and blood. But over the years of doing it, I, again, I go back to the different terrestrial UFO phenomena, right? And I think that what people are seeing is probably another species of extraterrestrial. I really do believe that. And, you know, I always think that movies know more than they know. And if you look at the Star Wars movies, with uh, what's the Chewbacca? Yeah, Chewbacca. The big, the big, it looks like a Bigfoot type creature. You know, I think that they, they, they've they seen things like this before. They based uh, these characters off things that we already know about. Um, I do, I always think there's like a little sneaky suggestion in, in certain movies just to give people the prompt. Yeah, it's, it's something that, it's something that I'm, uh, we've discussed it before and it's something that I'm going to start doing a little bit more research on but the UFO connection with wild men and, and Bigfoot and it's something that you've talked a lot about on, on your channel yeah. 
uh, and we've discussed. So um, very, very interesting. Um, okay, so I started off this interview by, you know, congratulating you on your 12,000 subscribers for the 401 files. So it only seems natural to um, round up this interview by asking you, what's what's ahead for the future for 401 files can you give us any kind of sneak peek into what to expect yeah i really want to get this documentary and work yeah, from I finish want. because it's becoming the pain of my life and um, so i'm working hard on that i've just got a new laptop so i can start work again um i've had a few setbacks along the way which just slowed um slowed it down but yeah get the documentary finished and i want to start on a second project which, which will likely be a second documentary um I don't know what that'll be about yet, but once the first one's out, start working with the second one. I'd like to try and plans in place to get out to Canada at some point to go film with Justin. That would be a great thing to do. Uh, that's definitely in the bucket list. And um, okay. okay, you have to put me in your suitcase then. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Can you imagine if all three of us were just out in Canada? Um, Creating documentaries and exploring that would be the light of the dream. We've talked we talked about it before, and it would be awesome. That would be my dream. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you need to make that happen. Like, I, I really do because I think once you're there, like really in the UK, so we've got um, we've got a mental measuring stick of how big things are. You know, like if I say to you, two hour drive, you know that roughly you're going to be about you know like where where you are in the country, depending from where you are. But in Canada, the scale is completely different. I mean, you can walk or you can fly over areas in Canada for hours on end and not see nothing but trees. You don't get that here. So just that experience alone, seeing the vast scale of things out there would be mind blowing. Yeah, it's an interesting point because we use the word wild a lot. And, yeah. you know, here in the UK, we've certainly got a lot of areas of remote countryside and, and, and we've certainly got areas that I would definitely describe as wilderness, but they don't come with the same presentable dangers as you can find in areas like Canada and in, in yeah. the States. You know, I used to live in an area of the States where you had to be very, very careful where you travel because if your vehicle broke down, you were in a situation where you could um, dehydrate and expire within a matter of eight hours uh, if, you, yeah. if you're absent of water. So that's a totally different ball game than what, uh, you know, some of the environmental stuff that we've got to contend with here in the UK. So I'm with you. It would be awesome. It would be majorly interesting. So yeah, let's make that happen. Let's get some sponsorship going and let's make that happen. Yeah, we should definitely. I'm trying to think of yeah, ways that we can get out there and make this happen because I mean, everyone would benefit from that. It would be my dream come true. The subscribers, the followers, people that are interested in this in this format would get the best content ever. Can you imagine if me and Justin collaborate on a documentary? Like, it would just be amazing. If you had, you know, we could even set off. And he goes one way for a few days and we have a rendezvous point on the map where we meet in a few days time. He's filming, I'm filming, we've got walkie talkies to keep in contact. It would be absolutely amazing. Would be indeed. And uh, I look forward uh, greatly to that day and I'm sure it's going to happen. So, but Ben, as always, you know, again, I can't thank you enough for um, all the advice and friendship that you've given me. And uh, I hope that I we can just you know, go on to collaborating like you were saying earlier. We've definitely got to make it happen and getting out with each other and and, yeah. and and filming. That would definitely also be super cool and interesting. But thank you for taking the time out on this lovely Sunday evening to have a chat with me. And um, I'm very excited to see w how the 401 files continues to grow. And I can't wait for that documentary. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. No. Thank you, G. It's been um, it's been a yeah, pleasure. No, thank you. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. Thank you, mate. Cheers.